So welcome to this episode of Menopause Conversations. Did you have a good sleep last night? Maybe you didn't. Are you in midlife? Do you worry about how much sleep you're getting? Well, we've got a fabulous guest for you. I'm delighted to have my, I'd say friend and guest, the lovely <laughs> Dr. Jill McGarry. And what this wonderful human being doesn't know about sleep is probably not worth knowing. But um, Jill is so much more than that. She's a chartered clinical psychologist and she's been a sleep expert for more than 25 years. And she really does help people get a good night snooze. So welcome, Jill. Lovely to have you. Oh, thank you, Amantha. This is such an important area for people going through menopause. So to invite me on is, is, is great. I'm hoping that we can offer tons of advice and support and just help people rethink perhaps what's going on for them at the moment so that they can make some improvements and go oh, improving your sleep can make a big difference in your life can't oh, it? absolutely now because mm. I don't want to waste a single moment just give people a little bit of background as to how you found yourself helping people sleep yeah so to make it quick and short I qualified on oh 28 years ago and I specialized in working with people with learning disability and autism um, and people with learning disability have a very specific sleep problem um, spe um when you have down syndrome because they have a bigger tongue which means their very their rates of a problem called sleep apnea are really yes. high yes. which means you can't breathe at night yes. um, and so we need specialist kit so that started my interest then we realized that people with autism struggle because of their sensory needs they hear things and also they don't feel quite as safe and secure in the same way that we do so that extended my interest. But then I had a car accident and I had um, it triggered a heart condition. And um, it meant that I became very self-aware that if I became excited or anxious, my adrenaline would go up. And if I haven't had a good night's sleep or I drank too much coffee, it would set this heart condition into action. Wow. So I liked my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I liked getting excited yes. or anxious I don't you know too much anxiety is not great but but some's good for us yes. so I decided I'd have to work on my own sleep Amazing. um yeah and I've had the heart operation now so um I'm fine but it, it, it means I learned a hell of a lot personally and then I had two kids and well that cha well sleep. that makes you an expert on sleep deprivation instantly yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and I have a relative who suffers from bipolar um, and we know there's a huge link between bipolar and sleep. We can work out that six months before an episode, if they start struggling to sleep, then it's likely they'll have another episode. So if we can correct the sleep earlier, we can stop the number of occasions that they have an episode. So um, wow. it's it's been in my life. It kind of has just always been there. And it, it's just got to the point whereby me going through the menopause and making decisions about what I wanted to do, I decided all this knowledge needed to be thought through and provided to other people. So um, I then moved away from learning disabilities, worked in a perinatal team because they suffer with sleep yeah, and have postnatal post psychosis because of lack of sleep. Did some work there. And then for the last year, I've been working in the Manchester sleep team. Um, but yeah, now I have ventured out into the private work and um, help as many women and men with problems because it's not just menopause it, it's lots no of absolutely and if I can just say right now there is also a link to a wonderful webinar that Jill was our keynote speaker at which we did for Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce and with a business spin on it as well so um, let's be under no illusion it's one of the biggest endemic problems in our society is that people are not getting enough sleep but we're going to focus the conversation mm -hmm. more around menopause and midlife today and um, but I will urge you to to go and see that other webinar but we're going to take a look through a number of things and um, I'll roll call some of them now so we keep people with us but we're going to talk about probably one of the most uh, common things it's like the symptoms of menopause and how those interact with sleep so we're we're also going to take a look at HRT because how does mm -hmm. that interplay with our sleep and we Jill and I have both uh, offline spent ages talking about um, a well-known coexisting experience alongside menopause which is histamine intolerance and that's known as the hundred symptom condition and that can really turn your sleep upside down so we'll, we'll cover that as well but Jill has got yeah. loads of, of top tips yeah. and she's going to talk us through some supplements as well but let's get going Jill because yeah. I know people this is mm -hmm. a topic we, I mean there's an alarming statistic about how long we spend, spend sleeping but what is it about menopause would you say that really does impact 
our ability to to get a good night's sleep? I think there's a few things. I think the most, well, one of the first things is physically it affects you because of the, the night sweats that people experience. It means that physically you just don't get enough sleep and you get out of bed and you want to change the bed in and your clothes that you're wearing. And then all of a sudden you're really alert. So just that very physical symptom Ooh. actually begins to have an impact um, and, and doing some things around that to start off with you know thinking about the bedding that you've got you might have used a duvet all your life quick and easy but you might need to start thinking about using sheets and what kind of materials to use so that you're cool you might want to think about wearing pajamas and socks and taking them off to cool down you might want to readjust some simple things like the radiator in the room but of course it might not just affect you it might affect your partner as well so there's conversations to be had that means that even from that very just one symptom you know the the main one that people might think that sleep's involved in it, it might need quite a lot of thought it might mean that you might want to think about having stuff by the side of your bed to help you you know and um, I often talk about having um baby wipes in um in ice so that if you get hot sweat in the night you might want to take them out and to cool your neck and to cool your wrist because the sooner you can cool those down the sooner your body starts to cool down right okay I might and suggest that, uh, and that, and that makes such a difference. I was laughing. I was um, talking to two individuals this morning about doing, doing a, a webinar. And we always get into the symptoms very quickly because I think women do find it easier, largely, yes. to be more open about these things. And we were saying it's the covers on, the covers off. My my colleague June Potts tells a brilliant story about that. Um, covers on, co covers off. And it's like, don't you dare shut that window type thing. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's yes. imperative to how, how we're feeling. But um, is, isn't it the the... The, we've got very large truncating arteries and things haven't we so actually if we can get something cool on there mm -hmm. under the armpit in the groin that can tend yeah. to bring down uh, our temperature so so let's talk a little bit then about the hormones that directly are assisting us to sleep so imagine we're in our 20s and 30s which of our hormones are helping us sleep so yeah. there is a it's not a hormone, but it's a neurotransmitter called melatonin. And um, we get melatonin from daylight naturally. Um, and it, we get it the most amount in the morning. Um, and that melatonin enters through our optic nerves in our eyes to into our brain um, to a place called the SCN, the super charismatic nuclei. And that part of the brain is like the grandfather clock that all your body clocks are attuned with. So it tells your bowel when it needs to sleep at night because when you think about it, oh, we don't ever want to go for a poo at night time, do we? No, we I never want to do that. We might want to go for a pee, but our bowel knows it's night time, mainly because that SCN, the super charismatic nuclei, has had melatonin during the day. So, like, okay, today's the day has started. We're going to do stuff, but night time it doesn't. So it's really, really important that that melatonin and that super charismatic nuclei is doing the job of setting what we would call our circadian rhythm. Wow. That's the most important neurotransmitter, natural hormone, yeah. um, all sorts of different ways of describing the same thing. But it, it is the most important chemical. That, but you can get supplements. So people often say, OK, Jill, so I should get some melatonin. Um, tablets and take those and I go no melatonin is only good for getting you off to sleep not to help you stay asleep that's why it it works you know it tells things to stop working so I often think of sleep as um a, we all call it a, um, a two-way model and um, but I like to describe it as the cistern at the back of your loo you know so the melatonin is like the flush handle so it sets the sleep in motion. But actually what you need is the water tank to fill up with water because there's no point flushing it again and again like people do. Yeah. There's no water and you have to wait for the tank to fill up with right. water. So we need our sleep pressure to build up through the day and then you can flush it. So how much sleep you have in your body is really important. And that sleep pressure is built up by having a drug in your body called adenosine. Okay. And adenosine is blocked by things like caffeine. So if you drink lots of caffeine at night, you don't want to go to sleep, do you? Because no. it's blocked that water building up. It, but the minute the effects of the caffeine stops, the water rushes into the tank and fills up. So we often say don't have coffee after um, lunchtime because coffee stays in your body a long yes. time. 
So it's a two way model. You need the flush, but you need the build up. Um, it makes yeah. so much sense. And actually, that really does resonate because I think there's the half life of, of caffeine is like 12 hours. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, that means 12 hours later, you've still got half the amount circula- circulating around. And, and, some people are more sensitive than others, aren't they? I could, I can, I'm actually, because I've, I've had my genetics done, I'm not caffeine sensitive. Mm-hmm. So I could have a cup of coffee. And I know my colleague, June, she always has a cup of coffee before she goes to bed because yeah. she doesn't have that sensitivity. And that's the important thing when you're doing sleep work is to take on everybody's personal situation. You know, it might be that you're not cough, coffee sensitive. It might mean that you're uber coffee, coffee sensitive. My husband can't have one after 10 o'clock and I can definitely have one into the afternoon. Um, it also means that you might need different amounts of sleep for each individual. You know, the idea that it's eight hours for everybody, it's not. It On average, you need it. It varies between six and nine hours. So to take on board what you need, personally is the most important thing to to not just read guidance and apply it as one size fits all it yes. doesn't help at all um because yeah. we know about genetically don't we um we both share the gene that we're we we're like late party girls uh we're mm-hmm. night owls aren't we I mean yeah. I come alive at half past nine at night uh, like like literally like bing But in the morning, and I've noticed this particularly, Jill, as I've been through, I mean, I've been perimenopausal for 15 years. um, And at times it has felt like a sentence um, rather than something to to be joyous about. I'm pleased to say that actually because I have the right supports and I know my body well enough, I'm I'm much better the last five years. But what I've realized is my sleep seems to have shifted. So if I describe it to you that um, I used to be able to get up early but now what I'm finding is I can stay up later, but I I do have a reluctance to want to get up mm. in, in the morning. What What's going on there? It feels like things have shifted. Yeah. So we're it's really important that people are aware of their what we would call their chronotype. So that general language about are you an owl or a lark? So if you're an owl, you'll want to stay up late. Some owls want to stay up till one o'clock in the morning and not get up till nine o'clock. Mm. Um, and larks are the opposite. They love the morning. And just being aware that you just don't like mornings is probably the most important thing, you know, and that maybe you do need that coffee in the morning to wake yourself up. Yes. You may need to take out, to have that coffee outside in the daylight to wake yourself up. You might need a warm shower to wake yourself up yes. because you're, the chances are you're living with a partner that's the opposite to you because it's surprising how even today we do align ourselves with the opposite. Why don't we align ourselves with the... the My husband is that person. He's he's like overly cheery in the morning I can't actually cope with it I and I and he'll laugh when he watches this back because I often just say not everyone's as ready to be this chirpy at (laughs) half past six just thank you for bringing me my tea please don't feel the need to wake me or talk or talk or (laughs) Or anything (laughs) yeah you know and to embrace it is really important because if we think that our bodies are still ancient, that when we were cavemen and cave women, it benefited us to have one person awake while the other slept because we could look after our brood. So it it makes, we're genetically, um, I don't know what the word is for it, made to be able to do, evolved to be able to do this. But actually it benefits us today. So, you know, my husband, Richard, my friends know that he can sleep anywhere and he loves to go to sleep early. I've got many a photo of him asleep while we've had friends around. Um, (laughs) And it's just who he is. Um, But it does mean that I can watch my TV programs at night and he can watch his Grand Grand Prix in the morning. You know, it means that we can do separate things, but still have a great life together. So it's not to be poo-pooed, you know, Often no. women get through, we were talking about this previously, about they go through life and they've they've not they've not led their life because of their chronotype. They've led their life because of today's light. Electric lights mean we, you know, anybody that lives a lark's life is on a benefit because work starts at eight or nine o'clock. Yes. You personally might not want to start then, but school starts at that time as well. So you yes. drop kids off, you go into work at a time that doesn't perhaps fit your chronotype. But when you get to the menopause, you might not have the kids anymore. You might be able to say, I'm going to adjust my time scale now. 
and and we are getting better at being flexible with hours um I was just working with a guy recently and he's a solicitor and actually they like the fact that he's an owl because he's still in the office when everybody else is gone excellent and he can answer the emails and get some of the work done before the the lots come in in the morning so it's about thinking okay I can now I can now use my chronotype. I may be losing some of the other things that might have been great about my sleep because as we get older, we don't sleep in one big chunk as easily. We can't maintain our sleep as easily. So there might be some things that get harder, but actually we might be able to sink into our chronotype or owl or lark better. But what we haven't spoken about that I, I love and the research is definitely out there there's quite a lot of it is there's a third type of person so a third of the population are owls a third of the population are larks and a third of the population are something else and one lady has kindly described it as a bear yes and bears love to nap so they're the people that like to have a so um Claudia Winkleman or be a bear because she loves a nap in the afternoon. Um, Nick Little Hales, an expert on yes. sleep, has yes. taught many professional athletes how to nap. So they're they're able to tap into an element of being a bear. So it's important that we we realize that, yeah, you might not be an owl, you might not be a lot. Actually, you might be a bear. And you're perhaps going to get through the menopause and aging better because if we don't sleep monos physically we can't sleep in one big chunk anymore as we get older they're ready to do the napping they're already in sync with that so you know there there may be some balance that some things get harder but some things we can do better as we age if if that well I love that so I'm I'm changing I'm going to stop saying I'm an owl because it's a standard joke in our house if if I say to everybody I'm just going to meditate that is code for she's going to have a sleep Mm -hmm. and I do that most afternoons and And do they protect that for you oh totally Mm -hmm. totally because I and I bought myself noise cancelling headphones nice and that is takes me to a beautiful place I have a very very busy mind I have a lot a high degree of self-talk goes on inside of my mind Jill yeah so to listen to guided meditations or I've been listening to um there's some frequencies you can listen to which are very deeply restorative I think something like 7.63 hertz if you listen to music and in your noise cancelling headphones it takes you to a very deeply restorative place and so I love doing that but actually it's really interesting what you said because I I I am doing that I'm giving myself time out and it's usually no more than 20 minutes definitely no more than 45 minutes for me and that sort of Mm -hmm. joins up a little bit with Nick Littlehales's work and to just take that break and listen to your body because actually that's that's what we need and the other thing I would say as well and I'd encourage people to do I've realized the best time for me to do my highest focused cognitive work is in the afternoon Mm -hmm. so I do what I call low-hanging fruit type activities in the morning um I might do a few little jobs in the house before I come to my desk or I am literally paying bills or yeah. putting zoom up in. nothing that requires too much cognitive function but that's great for me because I know I'm conserving that energy and not frustrating myself and so maybe one of the things we can also advocate for people as we go through this midlife stage is be open to the idea that your brain is changing and what you need to do is stop getting in the way of that but to actually maybe move alongside and give yourself what you need when you need without that judgment that we're so good at doing like berating ourselves that we're we're not achieving because we're not at our desk at eight o'clock in the morning and I think as women we need to do that even more you know because our hormones do fluctuate you know throughout the month throughout the day so it is really important that we become more aware of what our bodies are doing because we can benefit from the moments of high arousal as well as being aware that you know now might not be the best time to do things and it's not just about what chronotype you are and whether you're a lark an owl or a bear but it it's also being aware about what we call the arousal curve so throughout the day our levels of being really alert drop and then we become our least alert and between the very high alert to the least alert is 45 minutes so you 
the next higher moment is 90 minutes later. So being aware of when to do those things is really, really yeah. important. I mean, for me in my job, when I'm working with people with narcolepsy that fall asleep everywhere, knowing your chronotype and knowing when you're most alert and when you're not, just standing up when you're not your most alert can be really beneficial for somebody with narcolepsy. It just stops them completely dropping um, but being aware wow. that they might just physically drop and b- having protective stuff around them. Um, but it, it's really, really useful to know, OK, like you said, you know, I'm going to do emails now. I'm going to do them in a block because actually to get into doing it, I need a focus. So I'm going to do that. But actually, I'm only going to be at my highest arousal point for 40 minutes. So I'm yeah. going to chuck it in now and then take a break. You know, and I think that's what this world is not used to doing. We're not used to taking a break no. and doing things in a different mode. And I think for women, it's even more important. I think men, because of the way their hormones are, it's quite steady. It's quite paced. It's kind yes. of we're yes. on the same mode. We don't have to, as women, tread that same path. We can we can live an, an exciting life of high energy, low energy, high energy. We, we might we'll get to the same point at the end, but we've just got there in a different way that means we might we might experience and find more interesting stuff along the way um if you stay to the same path all the time it it might not be so interesting no and this is where our hormones do interplay don't they and often when i'm doing a symptom check with people that they they'll say oh no um well yeah i wake up a little bit during the night not a problem i then always say yeah how are you during the day oh i feel exhausted during the day Okay, so this that's that high and low that you're talking about. And what we know, and let's let's talk a little bit about HRT then, hormone replacement therapy. Mm. So as we know, as you go through perimenopause, you've got fluctuating hormones, and the hormone that fluctuates first is that progesterone. And um, I often explain to people the reason progesterone starts fluctuating first is because it's all determined by how many eggs are sitting in those ovaries. And as we get older, we've got less eggs sitting in our ovaries, which means we've got less caseins, which produce the progesterone. And so that's why we we go through perimenopause largely being estrogen dominant, which means we've got lots of places that our body will make estrogen. But really, progesterone is in very limited supply because it's largely relying on those ovaries and maybe a little bit from adrenals. But so what is it about estrogen that does as we go through perimenopause it really affects that quality of sleep because estrogen is an excitatory hormone isn't it Mm -hmm. so an estrogen um affects how much histamine is in our body and the so i often often describe the impact of that as we take if we take um an antihistamine like a peritone um it will zonk us out so we know that antihistamines make us sleepy therefore histamines wake us wake us up yeah. so we know that too much estrogen in our bodies actually can create insomnia so because we just can't sleep we're all wired and and wide awake so it is about being aware that it's not just your mind that all of a sudden you're really active in your mind like you were talking about before or you might be more worried because of that's what the hormones are doing to you as well yeah. But actually, physiologically, the histamine levels might be being affected and you are actually feeling insomnia because of that. So thinking about not just your thoughts, but actually what your body is telling you as well. And we have signs, you know, you and me have talked about we definitely both have signs that our histamine levels uh, are are too high. Um, Can I describe to you what it's like, how I know when my histamine is like, it's like I've got lemonade coursing through my body. I just feel fizzy. Yeah, yeah. I and feel the opposite. It's funny. Do you? Yeah. I just get a blocked nose. My sinuses are yeah. bad. I get a headache. I don't lie down. If I try to have a nap when my histamine levels have caused my sinusitis to get bad, I will find it really, really difficult to shake that headache because it's all just collected here yeah. in my head. So, yeah. And so, and so let's tell people why that happens. So um, in I always say, to, I describe it, in your 20s, you've got enough hormones like an, the Atlantic Ocean, okay? And it's all in abundance. But by the time you get to your 30s, 40s, it's like a small pond. But in that pond, 
you've got if 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 estrogen is the water and progesterone is the pond weed you've got a small amount of pond weed but a much bigger amount of estrogen and so it's out of balance mm -hmm. and so even if you're not taking hrt you'll be out of balance and it's that out of balance that signals to your body it's all right let's make some his let's make some histamine into the mix and that histamine will just drive up your estrogen even more but it won't drive up your progesterone. So we'll have even more water and even less pond weed now. So it, it's an imbalance that, that it isn't favorable for us. And histamine intolerance is known as the 100 symptom condition. And there's another video on here with Dr. Sarah Paul. Mm. It's, it's our most watched video. We've had over a thousand views mm. of it. I love it. We know that mm. histamine intolerance is a really big deal, but there is light at the end of the tunnel because like of lots of things in midlife, it's an enzyme and it's diamine oxidase. So you can take a supplement for that. But you found some great ways around it, haven't you? Like yeah. you, you were telling me earlier around now that you know that's a thing for you, mm -hmm. and it affects yeah. you. What do you do? Yeah, so to begin with, my GP didn't recognise it was linked to menopause. And it was only through linking with you and uh, Pam Windle and, and reading loads of stuff and listening to the podcast, like you said before, that actually I began to unpick the fact that um, I only started suffering from sinusitis last October when they increased my HRT. Um, and therefore I was like, oh my gosh, that virtually happened exactly the same month as that amount went up I wonder if they're linked so um now I am actually on a lower amount of HRT um and it, my symptoms have virtually gone I can lie down and have a nap now without it affecting me and um, I don't blow my nose as much as I, I used to do it was like a tap was on the end yeah, of my nose yeah. um so and and waking up in the morning is great now you know I would wake up feeling all heady um otherwise but also, what I realized was, do I want to be on a higher level? It has some of the other benefits for me. So what other things can I do? Because and so I started looking at what food I eat and because histamine is in the atmosphere, it is around us. So actually, we were sharing this before that food that isn't very, very fresh has higher amounts of histamine. And I am a sulfur lass and we love a bargain we would buy stuff on a bog off offer um rather than what we <laughs> needed um and that idea that you just put food together and you think what you might make with it when you've got it is my delight because I love a little bit of risk taking and I love a little <laughs> bit of spontaneity and um, so I love going to the local co-op at the end of the day at eight o'clock at night and going what's on the shelves that's going to go off yeah. but I can't do that no. if my histamine levels are going to go sky high because I've bought all the food that's still edible, still tastes yummy, but is high in histamine. I need to really stop and think about, do I really want to do that to myself every single day? Yeah. Is it really what I want to do? And I really have to think about my mindset, what automatically goes in my head from the last 20 years. Um, and I think it's the same for lots of people. You really have to rethink about, Am I doing this because it benefits me or is is it something that's entrenched in me that I don't need to hold on to any longer? So, you know, I, I, I have to say to myself, Jill, don't go down that aisle. Get the fresh stuff. Exactly. You to <laughs> exactly. And just to explain to people why it affects your nose, here's a little test for people. If you are applying your HRT or, for example, if you drink a cup of tea, caffeinated, and if it makes your nose go red, or you just get a sensation here, that is telling you you have a sensitivity to histamine. And it's because we've got cells in our nose, which are really, there's so many millions of them, they're called mast cells. And these mast cells are just holding histamine ready for a virus or a bacteria going up your nose, and then they'll release it. And that's what makes your nose snuffy. I mean, people used to say to me all the time, Jill, have you got a cold? Because I was permanently nasally and the reason that this interrupts your sleep is all of this inflammation here then converts to stuff dripping down the back of your throat and they call it post nasal drip don't they yeah. and that's what really starts to affect your sleep because you start coughing clearing your throat so these are little things for people to look mm -hmm. out for aren't they I think that's that's really nicely said, Amantha. But I also think what happens when people go to sleep is the nose will get blocked and the chances are they'll start breathing through their mouth more True. often. 
And what happens is if you breathe through your mouth, then your mouth is open. So if you think about, if you close your mouth now, your tongue is touching the roof of your mouth. Mm. Um, but when you have your mouth open, it's not there. So it's it's sagging down in your throat a little bit more. And then if you think you've gone from your throat flopping in your mouth there to all of a sudden being back, your tongue really flops into your throat channel and therefore blocks your airway when you're asleep so the chances of you suffering from that condition i described right at the very beginning called sleep apnea is increased and um, because you're not getting enough oxygen, oxygen into your body so there are signs that you you know you're suffering from that it is more common in men than women but uh, we haven't had any research done about women going through the menopause and are having histamine problems or sinusitis problems and whether that is beginning to happen. But it's also a habit. So, you know, I often say to women, you know, you might be a mouth breather because you've just become a mouth be breather. You know, that culture thing I was talking about before, a mindset yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. I've just done it. Does it make any difference? But our noses are meant are there for a purpose. You know, we weren't just filtering, it, on the filtering end of our nose. aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, the structures and like you said, different elements that are in there as well as the histamine to do that job. Lots of other things to filter out the the, the bad stuff in the air. Yeah. Um, so we need to use our noses. We know that athletes perform better if they breathe through their nose rather than their mouth. That is really hard, but athletes are doing better when they breathe through their nose. We know that we can, by breathing through our nose, stop um, elements of some kinds of asthma because again, we're doing the things in our noses rather than things happening in our lungs. So there's a whole host of books, you know. We really need to do some research, Jill. You and I need to do, yeah. we need to crack on and do some research so and get an abstract. You get women breathing through their noses, yeah. even though it's difficult, you know, when you've got sinusitis and, and, and it's affecting you, it might be difficult, but it's really, really useful to practice during the day. So often I will send people away just with our alarm going off saying, Oh, every 20 minutes, I'm going to practice breathing through my nose again. It's just a reminder again, because eventually, a bit like teeth brushing, it will become automatic because we were meant to breathe through our nose. Absolutely. And it's so good for oxygenating ourselves. When we're sat at our desk, mm -hmm. we're shallow breathing, aren't we? This isn't good for us cardiovascularly. Um, you know, all of that is so, so important. But um, if anyone is watching, I definitely do want to do some histamine intolerance research, please. So, uh, if anyone is interested yeah, to engage definitely. on that with me, yes. please, please do. Because mm -hmm. I think it, I'm sure you'd agree, Jill. I think it is largely hidden and people don't realise that these two coexisting conditions uh, need, for, need further interest and research because we're treating people, but actually we could be making the symptoms much, yes. much worse. Yeah, yeah so, definitely. It was happening for me. My um, HRT was at the wrong levels and, and wasn't being treated. But I think that, you know, we're, we're getting to a point in research whereby now we talk about gut health, you know, and a leaky gut. You know, if I'd have said that 10, 20 years ago, people would have laughed at me. But we we accept that now. There is so much research out there. So I think we are. It is a good time to begin to think about doing that research. Definitely. 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 So um, so. Coming back to, did we talk about the the Lux meter on your phone? No. So this is. Let's talk um, about the Lux meter on yeah, your phone. So I've, I've shared this with you a few times, haven't I? Yeah, I love it. it. And it's um, a really useful tool. So I've worked with lots of people, um, especially during COVID, when by they're living inside their house all the time and they're not getting outside, um, that they're all of a sudden saying, I can't get off to sleep. And actually, it is that thing we were talking about earlier on, that they're not getting enough daylight from outside. And what we need is 10,000 looks a day. So you might think I'm in a, in a bright office. In fact, a month is in a brighter office. That, oh, that, that brightness factor, looks factor, will be quite high. Whereas if I showed you a meter on your phone, let me see if I can find it on mine. It's a little symbol. Let's see if I can show it on there. That yeah. one, I think, it's Lux. called Lux. But it's and actually photographers use meter. it, don't they? Photographers use Lux meters to get perfect photography. Yeah. So inside my office, only 75 Lux, or perhaps it's going up it's now. It's gone up now, 122. Yeah. So it's nothing. It's not 10,000, is it? But if I went outside, it'd be higher. So I worked with one lady that worked inside all day. And then she went, oh, actually, I went out for a dog walk. I go out every day for a dog walk with my dog. But what actually she described to me was she was wearing a cap and thick sunglasses. So actually, none of that light could get to her eyes. So I said, take the hat off 
and the sunglasses. She goes, oh, but I'll get wrinkles. I said, you won't for won't increase your wrinkles for just a half hour getting the looks into your eyes to make it do the job it needs to do. So definitely, you know, um, I've worked with people that have postpartum psychosis and postnatal depression on a mother and baby unit. And, and we talked about the fact that if we could get the nursery nurses to go out with the mums for a walk every day for half an hour, it might reduce the amount of stay they have in the mother and baby unit. And it did. Amazing. It made a difference. So, you know, it's, it's a very simple thing to do. So for people with depression, I also talk about you don't have to do much. Go and have that cup of coffee that, or your breakfast in the garden or on a deck chair right next to your back doorstep, you know, or go down to the shops to buy your milk every day. Um, if you don't have a dog to walk and you don't want to walk without some a purpose, yes. um, rather than buying your milk or chewing gum or whatever, you know, go just go to the local shop. It might do getting your body active. It will also help you become more socialized. You know, I can't tell you how many times people now know me because I'm walking the dog at the same time as them. I now I'm able to say to hello to them at other times. So it has an effect on on your ability to socialize as well. And I think that's an important aspect of the menopause as well, isn't it? You know, they all interact, Definitely. you know, your ability to socialize actually improves your confidence, your self-esteem and um, your sense of being supported, less lonely. All those things are important. So that walk in the morning is not just about the looks. I think it has an um, an effect on your physicality, but also on your, your mental well-being. Definitely. Well said. Can I tell you, yesterday morning, I said I was saying to Jill, I'm walking for um, cancer research this October. I'm doing 100 miles and I'm I do my best thinking when I'm walking. I love it. You, you also make testosterone when you're walking, by the way. So it's great for you. And you're getting your vitamin D, aren't you? You're getting, I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many things. But yeah. do you know what I saw yesterday morning when I was walking? It was sent to me. It was the most beautiful autumnal, misty morning. I live up on the moors in Devon and there was a stag Jill in the road oh my God. most magnificent and it was sideways oh. on and then its head just turned and I saw its Look antlers and I was just like I was actually speechless which for me most people will understand is just a rarity and you have no one to share it to you just have to just like, sit and enjoy it but yeah. do you know what I didn't do I didn't get my phone out to take a no, photo good. I just mopped it up and I just thought I'm so glad I came for my walk. It's yeah. so good. You know, being out in nature, it's really good for us. Yeah. So we would encourage people to do more of that. Be grateful. So, you know, those things yeah, also make you stop um, and, and think about how important that is. And that's really important to your sleep as well. You know, taking that moment at night to, to calm your mind down. You know, you say you do meditation or by other means, lots of people do mindfulness. There's lots of yeah. apps there. But actually just having a notepad by the side of your bed to write down whatever's going through through your busy mind um, and some people do like doing a gratitude diary I do one I haven't got it with me I often take it places it's called a five-year project so it's a small diary and each page uh, you put the year and so it's the same date it won't be the same day each year no, of course but no. the same day and you put it in so but when you look at it you shouldn't just write in what you're doing you look back over the years before and see what you were grateful Aww. for so you will forget about that stag won't you yeah but if it's in your, if it's in your gratitude diary it will come back up um, and so amazing. Of course, some things that happened during COVID and people talk about COVID being awful, but there were some lovely things that happened during COVID. And I have, you know, because I look back over my diary and I go, oh my God, there's another nice thing to be grateful for. So you're not, you're layering, our brains are very good at being negative yes. and, and it likes to solve problems. That's why we've invented so much. That's why we're the cleverest species on the planet that have got all these amazing gadgets. Um, but because it's trained to do the negative and solve problems, being grateful is really hard and we have yes. to do this. Um, and having a journal or, or talking to people like you just did and saying those grateful moments are really, really important. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I, and, and I do think I'm watching the Blue Zones. Um, you know, I'm that is a great if, if anyone hasn't seen it already. It's honestly it's so in, in, you know transformative. We put it in our menopause programs, actually. But it talks about the common things for longevity and and so gratitude is really really important so as we sort of hurtle I mean we could talk forever Jill yeah. right but as we sort of come towards the end of, of our topic of menopause I did want to 
think, you know, not everyone is able to get out. Not everyone is able to do that. So then things like supplements can be really, really helpful. And I know that you've got two that we that we sort of said, actually, those could be quite useful for people to know about. I mean, and we wanted to put ones that have a little bit of research or yeah. anecdotal research behind them. So we've got we've picked two, haven't we? We've picked valerian and spirulina. So which one do you want yeah. to go with first? I want to go with virulina because that's the one that's got the most research on it and yeah. it and it and it's quite general so it's not yeah. just for people with menopause it's generally useful so most people when they're looking for sleep products they go to the supermarket and you'll find room sprays pillow sprays everything to help you sleep and they all talk about lavender they might talk about jasmine they might, might talk about bergamot um but they very very rarely talk about valerian however that's the one that's got the most research and be seen to be the most beneficial yeah. um, compared to all the others. So if you wanted to buy some of those things, they don't always work. They're just supplements. So there's some of it's a placebo effect, but actually it can enhance. It can't correct, but it can enhance. Um, so Valerian is the most important. I've got a bottle of it here. So you can buy it in tablet form. Can you see that? Yeah. Can I just tell Valerian. you something that whilst we've been talking, I I found out about it. Is it says it's one of the best. Um, they they have done studies on it. Um, for the first fourteen days, it's no more effective than placebo. But after twenty eight days, it is. So it's one mm -hmm. of those longer term things that maybe yeah. our body gets used to, and it's and it's helpful in that way. So, um, I particularly like valerian, and you can get it in bath salts and things, can't you? You can get it in bath salts, you can get it in tea. So I often talk about sleep hygiene, you know, because as busy mums and busy career ladies, we often don't do the sleep hygiene. And when we do begin to struggle with our sleep because of um, the menopause and generally in life, um, really thinking about your sleep hygiene and making sure you're doing all the things is really, really important. Um, I think I've talked before, haven't I, about the five pillars of sleep that, you you know, you've got to value it. So when we're younger, we probably don't value it because we just get it and we deprive ourselves as and when to get through projects and all the rest of it. But later on in life, we might suddenly consider, actually, I probably need to value it a little bit more now and I need to do something about it. So valuing it's really important and trusting it. So people that have got insomnia often don't trust their sleep. Um, and so there's some work to be done around that. But the three P's, as I call them, are really, really important. You need to prioritize it, you know, so doing all the things that help and sleep hygiene and getting the things in sleep hygiene right is really useful. We don't want people to become obsessive about it. We don't want people to go, I need it, I will sleep, I'm going to start clock watching it. Um, that would cause a thing we often call as orthosomnia. Um, it, it, it can make it worse because sleep's one of those things the more you think about it the worse it can get so we yes. want you not to think about it to become natural that's why sleep hygiene is so important because if you do sleep hygiene well you won't even think about it it'll be like no. brushing your teeth yeah um, and sleep hygiene is as important as brushing your teeth we know that dental hygiene will stop us going to the dentist if we do sleep hygiene it will stop us having sleep problems once you've got a sleep problem though we might have to do other things. Sleep hygiene alone might not just work. We might need to do some other things and investigate what the problem is. You might have, as you get older, restless leg syndrome, or as I said before, sleep apnea, um, or other conditions that might come along. And some of that might be due to vitamin D deficiency we talked about before, or iron deficiency. And um, so we might need to do some specific work, but if you're looking after the sleep hygiene, that can be really helpful. And you can put something like that valerian in a tea form and make it part of your routine at night so a nice hot drink at night three or four hours before you go to sleep though can be really really beneficial and it's it's not an old wives tale it can benefit you what the old wives tale doesn't tell you is it needs to be that three hours beforehand because what we're wanting to do is to raise our body temperature by having the tea but when you stop taking it it's like getting out of a bath you suddenly shiver don't you and it gets really cold what we're wanting to do is create that shiver because if we think about when we were cavemen and cave women and we were going to sleep it was cold and it was dark so we want to make it dark but we want to make it cold so that shiver and that sudden drop in temperature helps your body go oh okay i've got the sleep. signal it's time to go to sleep but if you have it too close to bed your body's still in that heat moment and your body's going, yeah. oh, it's a hot day. The sun's come up. I'm going to stay away. So yeah. you just, you need, a, you need to ride the heat and head off into the, the coolness of it. And um, so having something like Valerian can make a, a difference in, in having some of those sleep hygiene bits in place. 
Oh, that is brilliant. And I think that's really helpful to also remind, I do see a lot of people who come to me who've maybe been started on HRT and maybe because it's a short amount of time in a consultation, they haven't been told when to take their progesterone. Can I please remind people, if you are taking progesterone, take it at night because it is promoting sleep. If you take it in the day, you, it can really affect your ability to drive. And in fact, it does actually mm -hmm. say that. So you should be taking your progesterone at night as, as I actually cannot sleep without my progesterone, Jill, um, yeah. because of that estrogen dominance. But as soon as I have it, within half an hour I'm ready I'm ready to sleep but it's really helpful that you have said that about the fluid thing as well because mm -hmm. one of the first symptoms that people notice is regular night waking I used to wake at 12 59 every single night for five years to go to the toilet it didn't matter if I restricted my fluid it didn't matter whatever and that is because progesterone is also like um it's like insulation so think of your cable on your phone um or on any plug point it's insulating our nerves and what happens is that insulation gets a lot thinner around our bladder nerves and so mm -hmm. you only need a thimble full and your body's like oh need to go and empty mm -hmm. that so so that whole thing of like you say warm drinks working with the body systems that are millennia old you know yeah. we're not about to change those anytime soon no. it's really really important so coming on to then um um spirulina spirulina however you yeah. eat it so, so spirulina and i've brought it with me in a little container um so this is really good for getting melatonin so if you're not able to get outside and you're not able to go for a walk for half an hour then you might be being depriving yourself of that melatonin and so this is a substance i do prescribe to well i don't prescribe because i'm not a prescriber but i do suggest strongly suggest to people that have got autism because they can't synthesize melatonin but actually it's a nice supplement you know if you think you're not getting enough daylight it can help so it's called spirulina and, and what is it, spirulina isn't it an algae so it is an algae it's like icing sugar but a dark green color so you don't want to spill it because it will stain everything okay and um, but you can easily put a little bit in those shot. Have you seen those in the supermarket, like a ginger or a yeah. turmeric shot? You can put a spoonful of that, like a little tiny teaspoon, and along with some tropical fruit, shake it up and drink it. And you wouldn't even notice, you know, I, I've given long, longer drinks of that when I'm doing a workshop on sleep. Yeah. Um, and people go, actually, it tastes all right. The, the tropical fruit is a nice combo that takes away the taste you would not just put it in your mouth on a teaspoon because it is like icing sugar. It will clog your mouth up and it's not a very nice substance, yeah. but it it's a nice little tonic and um, that could be quite useful to some people and very beneficial to some groups of people. Yeah, because what them. we know is algae and you get these blooms, mm -hmm. you know, and wheatgrass and things like that. It's, it's because they're absorbing all those rays from the sunlight, aren't they? And they're, mm -hmm. and they're making chlorophyll and they're doing all that they do, taking all the carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere and yeah. turning it, giving us back oxygen. Yeah. Oh, my God. Did you see where all that came from? I obviously I know. didn't have so something on board during my degree. <laughs> <laughs> I was having to just think drink, very carefully back. I just, back I just wasn't drinking, drinking all the time. <laughs> um, I was terrible in my first year. I was party central. Um, oh. And then I suddenly realised, actually, you need to knuckle down and do some work for the next three years. But um, but no, it, it is fascinating that we're all part of this much bigger ecosystem, aren't mm -hmm. we? And actually, we've forgotten that in this very technological yeah. age, yes. haven't we, that that we that we live in so you know and so we do forget about daylight you know we've talked about it before we need to make it dark at night you know that yeah. idea that daylight is really important during the day but darkness is really important at yes. night so using yes. those eye masks having blackout blinds is really really important because we've created artificial light which means we have to block it out to get sleep so i know i was talking about the three p's before so you've got to prioritize it you've got to personalize it so that chronotype and knowing what your lifestyle's like and and what's influenced you is important but you can get other people to protect it so you know putting a notice on your door do not disturb when i'm yeah. having a nap because yeah. it's really important meditation, to me we call yeah, it some meditation <laughs> um or, or make so one client I've just worked with, she's she's had insomnia for most of her life and um sleep apnea. Um she phoned me up, she was uber excited. She goes, I've solved the last bit. 
Um, um, my husband has just put up a blind um, and I no longer have that five o'clock waking. You've been telling me for ages, Jill, I need this um, element. And I didn't realize it would make such a difference. She goes, and I'm now sleeping till eight o'clock. It's fantastic. Amazing. So, do you know, sometimes in sleep, it's it's complicated to find out what's not working, but it's simple solutions once you know. That is so true. And you know, it makes so much sense. I really read loads when I had my daughter. And so we had blackout blinds. And we if we used to go to hotels or visit friends, we had a, a, a roll of blackout material. And we used to pin it up. I mean, what our friends must have thought of us. But my daughter has always been a really good sleeper. Um, yeah. And actually, you know, so we've got one of those like Lumi bio clocks, which mm. wakes us up to light. And you can you fall asleep to a sun sunset, which, yeah. which can all be lovely tools and aids. But I think what we're saying, and this is maybe where there is brilliant crossover in menopause, is um, the solutions usually the, the the biggest wins are when we look at how we're living, yeah. and whether how we're living is enabling us to thrive. You know, my first thing that I go to is not HRT believe it or not, when I'm coaching women through menopause, actually what we talk about is what are your pillars of health? What are you eating? You know, how are you sleeping? You know, what are you grateful for? What's your idea of fun? All of these things, you know, how are you con- How are you managing your stress? And if, if lack of sleep is the biggest impact on your stress levels, then that's what's robbing you of your natural levels of hormones. So is there anything I haven't asked you, Jill, before we finish Just today thinking, that you might yeah. want to say to people? I think just hearing what you said then about people lump lump fatigue and sleep into the same box. So really, if somebody's saying they've got a sleep problem, ask them, is it a tiredness problem, a fatigue problem rather than a sleep problem? So really get them to explain it because it might be a fatigue thing. It might be that vitamin D. It might be that iron level. I've just been working with a gentleman who does have ADHD and we had to work on his melatonin level. So we've done all that work. We've done his work then on trusting his sleep. So he's been working on his insomnia. All of that is sorted. So his sleepiness scores were low. He didn't fall asleep all over the place, didn't feel exhausted, but he was still tired. He was still fatigued. And actually what we needed to do was look at other things. So working on that whole body idea, oh. we worked with a nutritionist. And actually what we've worked out is he's allergic to eggs. And during COVID, what he was doing, because he was at home, he was cooking scrambled eggs and other eggs in the morning. He really wanted to get healthy. So he was getting protein in his body. But actually he was fatiguing his body out. So knowing your own personal sensitivities, you know, and 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 really thinking about what you're saying when you say you're sleepy can make a big difference to what direction. Good point. You might get the point Good clarification. Yes. And that is, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I do focus on that with my clients because it, they are two very, very different things, yes. aren't they? Um, but, but interplay. So that's yes. really, really helpful. So, the big things, just in summary, that I've taken from what we've talked about today is that, you know, very much that number one, those physical effects of sleep disturbance, you know, and actually how that's making you more alert is what we started with. We talked about melatonin and actually how that is really, really important for that stimulus for sleep um, and talked about caffeine and how that can interplay and block. We also talked about individualizing your sleep. So let, don't be a slave to the seven and a half hours. You know, if you're a six to nine great but actually and it's not that monophasic actually mm. if you're getting like I do a little stop gap I always make myself a hot chocolate mm. I'm obviously giving all my secrets away now but I give myself a hot drink and sometimes if I need to be really up uh, like like 20 minutes I actually have a cup of coffee oh. which is warm before with caffeine in it I do Perfect. my meditation and then I'm ready to wake up that's a little it's the advice we give to night shift workers, especially doctors, because after their little nap, when they're doing a night I'm shift, focused. they need to be really alert. They need yeah. to make sure the, the numbers add up when they're they're doing their oh, job. So I'm, so that I'm really pleased with myself because I know that works for me and I'm much yeah. more focused. And then number five, we said, no, your chronotype. Who knew that bears? I love mm-hmm. I love the idea of bears. I'm going to call myself a bear from now on. The whole on. of Spain and Asia are bears, aren't they? So yeah, they yeah, it, yeah, so exactly. And... Our second spring in menopause replicates the bears coming out of hibernation. Oh, yeah. I haven't thought about it in that way. Yeah. So that's what we say. You know, we when we're going through menopause, we're really going through the winter season and bears are sleeping. Yeah. We're mm-hmm. keeping themselves contained and mm-hmm. not, not exposing themselves to all the elements. But actually, as you wake up, 
and coming through menopause and into postmenopause, that's your second spring. So we need to embrace it. Yes. It's about mm-hmm. 10,000 lux a day. Um, mm-hmm. Luck yourself out is or lux yourself out. <laughs> and we talked about then protecting, personalizing and prioritizing your sleep. And I would urge people to go and watch the other webinar that Jill has done. And and I'm going to ask about people to engage with you. But mm-hmm. the last thing we said is then those sleep hygiene and actually question, is it tiredness or fatigue? And what I would say is, please, please, please reach out to amazing experts like Jill or get in touch with myself and I'll put you in touch with Jill. But Jill, how is the best, what is the best way for people to be in touch with you and know more about the work, the brilliant work you well, do? Well, I have a website and it's really simple. It's sleep better doctor. So um, that's what it says on the tin. Yeah. So you can easily get hold of that. W- it's doctor, w- it's doc- doctor, the full word. Doctor. Yeah, sorry, the full word. Yeah. The so sleep, sleep doctor. Better. What's the end? dot co dot uk okay and you're on linkedin as well aren't you yeah so you'll find me as dr jill mcgarry there is no there is other jill mcgarry's but there's no dr jill mcgarry and jill with a j so if you put yeah. dr jill mcgarry in you'll only you'll find definitely me. find jill yeah. you'll see her her yeah and page. my credentials are there my experience my recommendations so um both of those and you've made a, really and you've made a world of difference to the people that attended the thames valley chamber and i know so many people reached out to you um so you know we only have experts on this menopause conversations podcast and so you have been a brilliant brilliant guest jill and i hope to get you back again so thank you so much for giving your time you're such a busy person so thank you so much for generously giving your time and your you know the things that people can think about and if they're struggling to definitely get in touch with you but for now yeah don't struggle alone definitely and i'm so glad you invited me amanda is the more people we can help the better Definitely. Touche to that. Thank you, Jill. No problem.